Hey guys! Hey! This is the Witches, Magic, Murder, and Mystery Podcast. And I am Kara. And I am Megan, and we are recording remotely. And okay. Kara has her sweet little foster puppy, which you might hear. I was, that was literally about to say that. Like, listen, guys, <laughs> she's adorable. But Tell she them how you funny. found her. Well, I literally was at the animal. What was it? Oh, I was picking up flyers. I know the ladies that run our local animal shelter here. I've known them forever, and they're amazing. And I help them with uh, marketing stuff every now and then. And I went to pick up flyers for one of their upcoming events to hand out at the coffee shop. And one of the animal control officers comes out of the back with just like this puppy wrapped in a towel. And I was like, I'll hold it while it, you know, is drying <laughs> off. While I'll I'm hold waiting. it for any reason. Cause yeah, it's a puppy. exactly. And I'll just wait for my flyers to be ready. <laughs> so I'm holding it and they're like, yeah, the mom, we had to go get the mom and like five of its puppies or whatever. They were all, you know, in the streets and stuff. The mom and the puppies weren't leaving this one area and we couldn't figure out why. And then we found out one of the puppies was stuck in one of the pipes near it. And I was like, oh, my God. And they were like, yeah, you're holding the pipe puppy. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, my God. So yeah. I brought her home for the weekend, but she needs a little more socialization, a little more help. We're all like, yeah. was she just like oxygen deprived? Because she's got <laughs> some issues. But she's so sweet and cute. So it's yeah, just, it's the picture like, you showed me was so cute. My gosh, she's adorable. But the separation anxiety is so much. She just screams. Yeah, you know Unless what? She's Same. with Art. <laughs> I know. But our big dog loves her. So they're yeah. Good. Oh, good cute. Her. Yeah. All right. Well, now okay. we've had our little feel good moments with the puppy. Yeah. And keep that in mind. And then also, you know, I've done a couple episodes lately that have been like. You know, Agatha Christie and the Leather Man, those were like not awful. Right, right. So just keep all that so in mind too. So you're going to surprise no. us with something really good again and wholesome, right? No, no. No, okay, no. okay, okay. Just okay. hang on to that energy of, uh, of the good stuff. Sweetness. This okay. is normally not an episode I would do. Oh my so gosh. It's what? trigger warning for sex all crimes. Things? Oh God. Wow. Okay. I know. I don't, I don't know. Wow. This is not a Megan. Okay. Once I started reading about it, I was like, I don't know how I didn't hear about this. Right. And so, and it's a Kentucky one. Oh my God. I just felt like I just wanted to tell the story. Yeah. Even though I feel expect some of you to be angry with me about it. <laughs> Cause, yes. Cause always. it's horrific. I hate sex crime. I mean, I, <laughs> nobody likes <laughs> sex crime, right? but I don't, that's not my brand of true crime that I'm right. super interested in yeah. hearing about. It's we too like upsetting. Those. We don't like yeah. doing ones about kids, but every now and then we will. Right. Um, oh, we had somebody who sent us a story. You may have seen this email. It's been a while back. They'd sent us a story and then they sent us another email a while later and they were like, oh my gosh, I just heard you say on the podcast that you don't like to do stories about kids. And I'm so sorry. Like they apologized for oh, yeah. a kid's story. And I just was like, it's totally okay. You guys don't feel like you can't send us something Yeah, if it's a sex crime or a story about a kid. Like it's totally yeah. fine. It doesn't mean that we won't cover it. It's just they're harder. And so they're much fewer and far between. They just take a lot of my mental energy yes, exactly. to deal with. And this one's a lot. This is a lot. So oh, man, okay. it was emailed to us by Melanie. I'm not going to read the whole email, but it just says, Hey y'all, which I love. I love been, it when people that aren't even from here say that. Yeah. Well, she is from here, but yeah, oh, I love yeah, it too. Yeah, yeah. Also, we've gotten so many people lately who've emailed and they're like, this is Rebecca or Rachel, or this is yeah. Jennifer or Rachel. My this name's Jessica, Anna, but you can call me Rachel. Anna, Rachel, but actually this. Yeah. yeah. We're going to need to make a Rachel t-shirt. I've decided. Yes. All right. So she says, Hey y'all, I've been binging the podcast lately and I'm a huge fan. Thank you, Melanie. Yes. I was are. just curious if you all had considered covering the Jessica, I think it's Deshaun murder. Okay. Could be Deshaun, but I think it's Deshaun. It happened in Shepherdsville in like 1999 to 2000. I don't remember too many of the details offhand, but it was highly publicized. I think it would be super cool to hear you all dive into it. Thanks so much. And I can't wait for more episodes. Best, Melanie. Love it. So, Melanie, thank you for sending this to us. Yes. Because, again, it did happen. I think it's 1999. And it's like, how did I not hear about this? Shepherdsville is not that far away. Right. Okay. So, Jessica Deshawn was born on May 2nd, 1982 in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, which is a smallish town about 20 miles from Louisville. Okay. That's what I was about to say. Is it close to Louisville? It's where we go I to the outlets. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Shepherdsville. It has a population of about 14,000 people right now, but it was like 
5,000 people in 1980, which I thought was weird. It's like a huge jump. Yeah. And obviously I can't just let things go. So I had to Google and figure it out. Uh Shepherdsville has grown 68.3% since 2000. It's growing faster than 84% of similarly sized cities. That's wild, isn't it? That is wild. So there's that. I guess I'm just making that point for those of us who are familiar with the area. Like I said, I just go to Shepherdsville for the outlets. And to me, it feels like basically you're in Louisville. It doesn't feel yes. small yeah. townish. No, not at all. But in 1980, it was really about the size of my hometown. Which and, is a little. Oh, my hometown has been three to 4,000 people for the entire time that I've been on the right, earth. Exactly. <laughs> it's not changed. Yeah. Jessica lived there in Shepherdsville with her parents, Michael and Edna, and two younger brothers. She was a good kid. She was one of those kids who people just described as like, she's real responsible. She already knew what she wanted to be when she got out of high school. No. She had plans to go to college and become an accountant. She loved math and numbers, Kara, j- just like Same. we do. Same. Yeah. We love Com- it. Completely. hundred percent. Language arts, math and numbers. 10 out of 10. Would not do ever. <laughs> 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 On September 10th, 1999. Jessica's mom, Edna, came home around one o'clock and Jessica's car was in the driveway, which is weird because Jessica should have been at school. Um, School didn't get out till like 2.30. Okay. So Edna's like, why is her car here? Like, what's wrong? Why is she home? So she goes inside calling for her daughter and there's no answer. So then she calls her husband and she's like, you know, have you heard from Jessica? And he's like, no, I have no clue why Jessica wouldn't be in school. Yeah. So then she calls to school and learns that Jessica had not been there at all that day. Oh, so this was before the days when the school would call you to let you know when your child wasn't there, you know, okay. this actually made me wonder when that started because I am me and I'm sure you're the same way. I yes. assumed that something awful must have happened to a student somewhere who the parents thought was in the school. And this prompted like a nationwide thing uh-huh. to make schools alert parents when their child is yeah. in school. So I tried to look it up. And from what I can tell, it isn't even a nationwide thing. Huh? Are there schools that don't do this? Guys. What? I want to know <laughs> why are there still schools that don't alert you when your child is absent from school? Like was... both of my kids, if they're late, I get a text and a phone call. Hey, yes. So when I Google it, I just get random news articles in different States. Like in Ohio schools had to start doing this after the murder of a girl named Ileana DeFries. She went missing, but her parents didn't realize it until late in the day because they had thought she was in school. So now Ohio schools have to call parents when a student is absent, but that didn't start until 2019. What? Not as a statewide thing. There may have been like districts here and there in Ohio that did it, but as far as it being a law, not till 2019. Oh my gosh. So I just thought that was crazy. All right. Yeah. Back to my point. (laughs) (laughs) So Jessica's parents had no idea that she hadn't gone to school that day until Edna got home at one o'clock. And when she checks Jessica's car, she sees her cell phone, purse, backpack, and one shoe. What? So Edna and Michael start calling everyone they know, but no one has seen or heard anything from Jessica. So then they go to police where they are told, let's give it one more day. Oh, no. If she's still missing tomorrow, come back and we'll file a missing persons report. But she's not even an adult. Someday I want to do an episode on why this was a thing. Yes. And probably still is a thing in some ways. Yes. Place. Yep. So Michael and Edna... They trust the police. They assume that this is the right move because the people in authority are saying this is the right move. So they go home and they wait until the next day and Jessica does not come home. So they go back to the police station and then they file the missing persons report. Now, of course, police start with, well, maybe she just ran away. Oh, my gosh. But like I told you, Jessica was one of those like good kids, you know, like her family knows her. They know that she's not going to just run away. She wouldn't do that to them. She isn't that kid. Right. Besides all of that, all of her belongings are either in her car or in the house. Like she didn't take anything with her. If she ran away, Mm -hmm. she took nothing with her. Yeah. Like, so when police searched the car, they noticed signs of a struggle near the driver's side door. And now they think Jessica may have been abducted. But they don't have any further leads. Oh, my God. Her family puts up missing persons flyers, and then they and the FBI offer an $18,000 reward for information. 17 days later, a bus driver calls 911 after spotting a body in a ravine as she drove her usual route. This was seven miles from Jessica's home. And in Melanie's email, she said that the body was found about five miles from 
the home she was living in at the time. So that's oh why the gosh. case that kind of struck home for her. So as you can guess, the body was Jessica mm-hmm. sitting up against a tree. Sitting up against a tree. Not mm-hmm. even just, oh my gosh. Okay. No, not just laying there. Sitting up against a tree, pants down, a rope around her leg. <sighs> so like I said, this was the bus driver's just usual route. Uh-huh. But she hadn't seen Jessica's body there until now. Okay. Which led police to believe that the body may have been moved and that uh-huh. the rope was used to move her. Oh, God. Yeah. An autopsy showed that Jessica's cause of death was strangulation. Oh. There was no forensic proof of sexual assault, but police suspected it based on her pants being down. Right. But also, if they believe that she's been moved, then, I mean, her pants could have been down, like, pulled yeah. down in the mood. Like, yeah. who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the rope was there to drag her. Right. I hate thinking about this, but to drag her by her feet, then. Right. I mean, who? it's I just, know. it's hard to say. So, police start honing in on the Deshaun's neighbor, a 40-year-old farm worker named David Brooks. When police were canvassing the area and questioning everyone, David was like, yeah, I saw Jessica the day she disappeared. She was walking towards school. Later. When he's asked the same question, he was like, yeah, I saw Jessica the day she disappeared. I, she was by her car. Oh. And, we you know, we don't like it when stories change. Right. No, no, no. So David had said he was at work the day Jessica was taken, but no one else was there at the time to confirm this alibi. Several witnesses said they saw David's van on the road where Jessica was eventually found in the days leading up to the discovery of her body. When police search the van, they find rope that looks like the rope found on Jessica And they also searched the Brooks property with a dog and the dog found a pair of work gloves seemingly hidden under a cushion that had a strange odor to them. Oh, 16 months after Jessica was taken, David Brooks was arrested and charged with her murder. When this went to trial in January of 2003, prosecutors were seeking the death penalty and then the case fell apart. And this fascinates me. The lead investigator Was like, yeah, well, David became a suspect because he failed a polygraph test. Oh. But polygraph tests are not admissible in court. No, they don't hold up. Right. In 1998, they were ruled inadmissible because they do not rise to the level of reliability required by scientific evidence in a courtroom. Right. The results of the polygraph test can mean many things, and they do not reliably detect lies. So David had actually taken six polygraph tests. Four showed signs he was... yeah. And of the six, four showed that he was being dishonest and two were inconclusive. (sighs) Yeah. But I mean, I'm also like, I get so anxious if I think someone thinks I'm lying. Right. I can be fully telling the truth. Yes, exactly. But if I can tell they don't believe me, I get real freaked out. And I'm like, I bet you I'd fail a polygraph. Well, I just bet you I would. Yeah, exactly. Because I can walk into a doctor's office and be like, hey, you're welcome to take my blood pressure now, but you're going to have to take it later too. Cause I have white coat syndrome. So I for sure would have that in that scenario too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you have high blood pressure. Yes. Yeah. So like, I mean, if you're on the Patreon, you heard me talk about on this month's episode. I can't remember if it was yours or mine. I think it was Kara's episode this month, how I would totally be a person who would give like a false confession. Oh, yeah. I would so easily be manipulated into that. <laughs> like, I'm 100% <laughs> sure. And it's the same thing as why I'm sure I'd fail a polygraph. Just, like, I am too anxious. And I can't, same, like, if yeah. someone thinks I'm guilty, if someone thinks I'm lying, yeah. I just don't handle it well. Anyway, he fails four, I guess, and then two were inconclusive. So the case against David is dismissed, and Jessica's case goes cold. Fifteen years pass. Then a Louisville Metro Police Department detective named Gary Huffman calls up Detective Lynn Hunt in Shelbyville. And he's like, I've got a story for you. Oh, Gary worked a lot with convicted felons and he would often ask them if they ever heard anyone admit to a crime. And usually they said no. But then one guy was like, I know who killed Jessica Deshaun. And Kara. (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. This is about to take a turn that I did not see coming. When I started reading this. No. Here's the way, just real quick. (laughs) Here's what happens when I get a story. Okay. Here's this. Yeah. I get the story. I do a lot of Googling and I'll start copying and pasting all the articles I can find. Yes. Yep. And then I read them and I write up the episode as I go. So like 
when I'm writing this episode, you are getting my real time. Right. That's our take. <laughs> putting this it. together yeah. and reacting and thinking or whatever. Because yes. basically when I write the episode, I try to do stream of consciousness yeah. so that you guys do get my real time. Yes. Not polished. Yep. Don't know how to pronounce anything. <laughs> thoughts. So even though I had copied and pasted and it's like, I kept seeing the name. I just uh-huh. didn't put it together. Uh-huh. <sighs> Jessica's uncle. Stanley Deshawn was her dad's brother, and he was also in prison, which is how the inmate who had spoken to Detective Gary Huffman knew Stanley. Oh. And he said that Stanley had killed Jessica out of anger, jealousy, and fear that she was going to tell everyone the truth. Stanley had sexually molested her. Oh. He had lived in the Deshawn home with his brother and his family for years, up until Jessica was about 13. Hmm. Police found this to be credible because Stanley Deshawn had a criminal history of sexually abusing young girls. Oh, lovely. He pled guilty in 2004 to two counts of sodomy, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 2005. (gasps) So at the time that the detective, one detective calls the other, Stanley's Uh in prison already. Okay. But it's almost time for him to get out. Right. Um, A second inmate who had served time with Stanley separately also came forward saying that Stanley had talked about killing his niece. Those Mm -hmm. inmates, later identified as witnesses X and Y at trial, weren't offered any kind of deal or anything to testify about this. I did read that Detective Lynn Hunt said, I will write a letter to the parole board, like to let them know that you've done this, but like we're not going to, you know, let you out of prison. We're not getting any special benefits, nothing like that. According to both inmates, Jessica had argued with her uncle in the backyard Stanley was jealous that she had a new boyfriend and he was afraid that she was going to reveal the sexual abuse. Oh my gosh. He went into the home and got a scarf and strangled her. Um, Another inmate, one of the two gave more information across two more interviews saying that Stanley told him he had chased Jessica around the yard, strangled her, stabbed her, put her body in a vehicle and hid her under a brush pile by the water. What? He also said that Stanley told him he'd kept Jessica in a cabin for a couple days before killing her. One of the articles I read about this, it was like a blog post. It wasn't a news article, but someone had written a blog post where they were like, he said he had kept her in an abandoned barn for three days before finally killing her. But the thing is, I never saw that mentioned in any of the newspaper articles that kind of went through the court records. Yeah. So I'm not sure that that's true. But it could line up with what this other inmate is saying. And this was in the court records that he had kept Jessica in a cabin for a couple days before killing her. Right, right. But to think that she may not have been killed immediately, you know, because it does say that at the house, he chased her around the backyard and he got the scarf and he strangled her. But maybe that didn't kill her. Maybe it just made her unconscious. Yeah, that's true. I'm not sure. The timeline of all of this is a little confusing because it's like the inmate stories. So police put all this together, and I think this is the official timeline that they came up with. Stanley Deshawn drove to Bullet Central High School, which is where she went to school, to find Mm -hmm. Jessica to confront her over all of his anger. What on earth? Her vehicle was not there, so Stanley drove to her home. That's where the two of them got into an argument before he began to choke her. She fell down. He went into the home to get a scarf and strangled her. Oh, my God. The timeline does not mention Stanley Deshaun sexually assaulting his niece, and it does not say what he did with her body before it was found 17 days later by the bus driver. Oh. Police also discovered that Stanley had abused other girls in his family, the children of his relatives. My Apparently, God. he bounced around a lot, living with his relatives, and had a habit of molesting their little girls. Ugh. These girls were grown up now, though, and they agreed to testify against him, which is like... What badasses, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, Stanley Deshawn pleaded guilty to charges that he had sexually abused his daughter and stepdaughter. And he was also indicted for allegedly forcing a family member to have sex between 1982 and 1987. Oh, my gosh. Like, this is a very sick person. Yes, for sure. Stanley, of course, denies any involvement in his niece's murder. He says he didn't kill her. He didn't have sex with her. And he never spoke to any inmates about the case. According to Stanley, he was working the day of the crime, and there were people who worked with him who could testify to that. But when police looked for people to verify his alibi, no Mm -hmm. one could remember whether or not they saw him at work that day because Mm -hmm. it had been so long ago. Right. 
So his coworkers may not remember much, but his family members do remember that Stanley acted weird after Jessica disappeared. At one point, he called his brother, Jessica's dad, and had said, I had a premonition about where Jessica's body might be found. Oh. Mike Deshawn said in a police interview that Stanley told him Jessica was buried in the river bottoms. And that, the area where she was found, was referred to as the river bottoms. Oh. The family went and searched the area about two miles from where her body was eventually found. They didn't find her then, obviously. And during that search, Stanley had to leave because he felt sick. Huh. Stanley says he had talked to a psychic at the time who told him Jessica was in a wooded area within a seven mile radius. And he had just suggested the river bottoms as a possibility. Huh. Right. There's no indication that state police ever interviewed Deshaun uh, Stanley at the time of her disappearance. What on earth? I know. I think they thought she was a runaway. Right. Exactly. And so, well, yeah. yeah. How would they have known? <laughs> yeah. Right. And they zeroed in on the neighbor pretty quickly. So it's probably like, we don't even need to keep looking, you know? Mm -hmm. And Carol Ann Waters, which was, she was Stanley's former wife. She remembers thinking it was weird that nobody questioned him. According to Carol, Stanley acted really strange when Jessica disappeared. He was obsessed with watching news coverage about it. And he couldn't. She said that his sleeping patterns got worse after Jessica was found. Ugh. Not interviewing Deshaun wasn't the only possible misstep by police at the time Jessica vanished. Dave Greenwell, who was a sh- who's sheriff when Stanley went to trial, but he was a rookie deputy when Jessica disappeared. He mm-hmm. was the first investigator on the scene. And he repeatedly asked Detective Charles Mann to come to the scene, but Mann refused, saying Jessica's just going to come home on her own. Oh, no. Charles was dead by the time this came out, so he's unable to respond to it. Okay. But, I mean, we, we know that when her parents went the first time, they were like, just give it another day. I right, can't exactly. imagine oh, that feeling. I would, be, I would be like, well, I'm doing it on my own then. Okay. Yeah, you'd have to. But also, I get how, especially in a small town where you probably know all these police officers, oh, yeah, they're telling sure. you, you would just be like, yeah, if you say so, okay. Yeah. They're like, right. I don't need to get all worked up about this. Right. You know best. And it's almost like you don't want the whole na- the whole town talking about how crazy Deshaun's out there thinking. Oh, yeah. Daughter, you know? So it would be days before a detective saw the scene or Jessica's vehicle. And by that point, family, neighbors, and even some media had been in the vehicle, making it pointless to try to test it for fingerprints. Oh. Additionally, Dave Greenwell said he turned over his photos and notes from the scene to Jim Adams, the other detective on the case at the time. Uh Uh-huh. But that evidence has never been found. Oh. So... Even though it took years before Stanley was officially questioned by police, when investigators did sit down to talk with him, they caught him in a number of lies. He said he'd learned about Jessica's disappearance from her dad, but Mike says he didn't tell him. He's Hmm. like, I have no idea why he said that. Stanley also said he had taken off work for three weeks to help search for her, but that also wasn't true. Ooh. A neighbor told investigators that she had seen Stanley act inappropriately toward jessica oh no flapping her butt when she walked by no 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 what she said jessica would yell at stanley when he did this and this bothers me so much (laughs) yeah it bothers me that i mean not to blame i know people you don't know what to do but like you saw what happened did you say anything to somebody right exactly i mean i get that i guess you wouldn't necessarily call the police but would you say something to her parents and maybe she did i mean who knows but well, I'm a Your huge advocate for if my kid doesn't want to hug you, even if you're a grandpa, I don't care. Like, yeah. she's gonna, she can tell you she wants a high five instead. That's she's what I have been. No. I totally admit that when my girls were younger. Oh, yeah. I would totally be like, yeah, hug you, you hug your whoever. Yeah. Yeah, you and as I've gotten that. older, I'm like, why? I hate that I did that. Right. But like, it right. never same. occurred to me. But now as they've gotten older, if they're not comfortable, I'm, I'm the same. Right. Like, same. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to hug anybody. And if somebody else tries to make them, I'm always like, she doesn't have to hug them. Like, it's yeah. okay. It yeah, doesn't yeah. mean anything awful. It's, it's not disrespectful. A high five is fine. Yeah. Or just a goodbye. <laughs> That's- yeah. Okay. So before any of this can go to trial, Stanley does something that takes people by surprise. He took a plea deal. What? This whole time he's been like, no, I had nothing to do with it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then in court... He told the judge that he was guilty of killing Jessica as well as incest, sodomy, and rape charges that were in four other cases. Oh, my God. The murder charge was amended to manslaughter. And Stanley, who is now 56, 
entered an Alford plea, which we talked about before when we talked uh-huh. about the West Memphis Three. Yep. That's where he maintains his innocence, but admits there's enough evidence for a jury to convict him. Mm. You're pleading guilty by pleading innocent. <laughs> right. Now, when the judge is like, you have the right to a trial, Stanley paused and talked briefly with one of his attorneys. And then he says, I don't want to go to trial. I want to take the deal they offered. Oh. According to the deal, the sentences for all charges would run concurrently for a total of 20 years in prison. And he would be eligible for parole after 16 years. Oh, my gosh. I mean, so he's 56 at the time, which means he would be 76 if he isn't paroled and serves his whole sentence. Uh Uh-huh. And this man has habitually sexually abused young girls for years. (laughs) Right. He should never get out of jail. And I get he'll be 76. Listen, that's not that old. Okay. My dad is 73, I think. Uh Uh-huh. Might be 74. But however, he's in great shape. He right. can do all sorts of things. Okay, It well, doesn't seem that old to me. Like the Golden State Killer. But my thing is, like, sure, give him a slap on the wrist. Maybe if you're a state that does ankle monitors for sex offenders, sure, you know where they're going, what they're doing. But you yeah. don't know if a new young girl is in that area. You don't know if what's happening or a guy or whatever I know for a fact that like these sex offender roundups, when they go around to check to see if these sex offenders are compliant, a lot of them aren't. Right. A lot have moved in with girlfriends that have kids and the girlfriends have no idea that they're a sex Uh, offender. Yeah. Well, so I looked him up just to make sure. And it does say that he is eligible for parole on December 31st, 2028. And then his sentence will end on August 31st, 2033, if he's not paroled. Oh, my God. And it's just not long enough. <laughs> no, it really isn't. isn't. He's it isn't. a dangerous person. And I know there are people in the world, and I guess we need these people, <laughs> who are like, this is a mental illness and he needs to be helped. Fine. Lock him up and help him somewhere. He's not getting that help in prison. But right. But when but he gets out of prison, take that. him somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. Yes. I just... It makes me sick to think that he could be out ever. Yes. So in court, Mike Deshaun confronted his brother and Stanley stared right back at him while Michael broke down. He said, I let you into my home and this is how you repay me. Uh, Can you imagine your brother? I mean, we both have brothers. Can you imagine? It's your brother. Oh, and he killed your child. Like, I don't even know that he would have made it to jail. I would have killed him. That's not even accounting for the sexual abuse. Right. (sighs) The Bullock County Sheriff's Department, which had been much maligned for its handling of the case over the years, held Mm -hmm. a press conference after the guilty plea with Captain Murdoch saying, there is no doubt in the minds of those who worked the case that Stanley Deshaun was the only one involved in this murder. But both Edna and Mike who divorced about a decade before Stanley was charged with this. Mm -hmm. They believe someone helped Stanley arguing that it would have taken at least two people to move her body, which maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Mike still suspects that the neighbor guy was somehow involved. And I imagine if I were in his shoes and I knew about the polygraph tests and all that, it would be hard to ignore. Well, yeah. Critics of the case say that the case against Stanley is all circumstantial and based mostly on the testimony of those two inmates. Investigators did get a DNA swab from Stanley, but there was nothing to compare it with as the body in the scene had been destroyed after so many years. Stanley now says he didn't do it. He's like, I didn't understand what I was saying at the trial. My attorneys misled me. I didn't know what I was doing, which I mean, when he entered the plea, the judge asked, do you understand? And right. Like, yes. That's what I was so, going to say. I'm sure they thoroughly looked into this. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, Stanley Deshaun is allegedly mm-hmm. a living, walking, breathing, talking pile of garbage. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. <laughs> a trash heap. I think he's where he belongs and I hope he stays there. Yes. Oh, God. I just can't believe. I can't believe it. No. What's such a horrible story. I'm sorry, you guys. Yeah. I told you. Uh, I warned you it was going to be a bad one. People are horrible. To think of how he had preyed on so many young girls in his own family. Right. And just. It was just so. I, I hate, obviously, that Jessica died. Uh-huh. But it seems like that's what it took to get him 
to stop. Right. Because she was going to be brave enough to tell somebody. Yeah. And so in a way, she still did, right? Like fought for herself. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, because of Jessica, he was caught. And he was, and he, like I said, he'd already been in trouble for sexually assaulting Uh a young girl. But like now they knew that he also did this to Jessica and other girls in his family. So in a way, she saved them. And that's how I want to look at it. (laughs) Yes. She's the hero. What a monster. Oh, my God. Okay. That's all. (laughs) And now we're like, all right. (laughs) Now, today is the last day of September. Oh, my God. I'm so happy that October starts tomorrow. If you are listening to this on September 30th. (laughs) Uh, Have you decided if you're doing your Halloween, like, daily movie nights or, like... I don't know. I used to do this thing, guys, where really early in the morning, I would watch a horror movie every single day in October. So, like, I would have time to watch the whole movie before I had to go to work or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I do better if I watch them in the mornings because then it's not, like, if I watch them at night, then I have to go to bed. (laughs) Yeah. I was terrified, but I've been working so much in the mornings. I'm using that early morning time to get more work done. So I'm not sure. Although I do plan because both of my kids are pretty into scary movies, especially Lauren right now. Yeah. So I I am going to try to have a few movie nights with Lauren, but I doubt that I'll be able to watch a scary movie every day. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Maybe I just thought of this. Maybe we should post something on the Facebook group, like help us create like a scary movie thing. And then we can like, post like this cute little graphic with like all the like top 30 yes space for people to watch so i don't have to do all that <laughs> of doing a um you know how you do those instagram challenges where it's like on day one take a post a picture of this and it gives people yeah. something to post i was trying to think of doing a podcast related one and we could tie it in with halloween and spooky season and podcast stuff I just got to, you know, today's this September 29th and I'd have to pull it together before October 1st. <laughs> I know. I'm just like, Mwah. but I mean, you know, go look at our Instagram. Maybe that'll happen. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Uh, all right, you guys, thank you so much for listening and being here for the, you know, awful stories and the entertaining, story. more entertaining ones. Yeah. yeah. I think they're all important for any number of for reasons. Sure. Okay. We love you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye.